In the madness of 2020, with COVID, Black Lives Matter, mask mandates and all the rest, one of the worst responses from the broader church came from the Church of England. Justin Welby not only forbade ministers from holding services, but from even entering their own churches for personal prayer. Furthermore, the church implemented race quotas for leadership hiring, brought in official church blessings on same-sex marriage, and has been a full-throated supporter of every woke policy and idea under the sun. Yet, in the midst of this, three largely unknown Anglican curates from small churches started a podcast to push back on the growing darkness. It went on to become the biggest podcast in UK Christianity. In this discussion, I speak with one of the hosts of that podcast, where we look at their story, the state of the British church, and how the church can recover its prophetic voice to the nation once again. Good afternoon or whatever time it is, wherever you are watching this. Welcome to another one of these interviews. My guest today, who you can see on screen with me today, he is a minister within the Church of England. He writes for a personal substack. He also is the co-host of the Irreverend podcast, which is one of basically the largest Christian podcasts here in the UK. Written for First Things, husband, father, and also happens to have a truly, truly excellent first name, a real mark of greatness i would say so welcome to the show jamie franklin <laughs> thank you very much jamie uh, you're you're right about all of those things especially the latter it is indeed a great name absolutely absolutely it's uh it's it's very, it's, it's biblical almost in terms of james so you know we, we yeah, can, yeah 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 it's pretty good yeah. uh, you're, you're also a spurs fan i see which which I, I i was looking forward to a good conversation but we might just leave it there <laughs> Yeah, yeah. No, I'm a big Spurs fan. Uh, I, I grew up going to watch them. My dad used to take me. I lived in Essex. I grew oh, up in yeah. Essex, but my dad used to take me to, to White Hart Lane when I, was a, when I was a child. So I've got, you know, you got, you know, I've got local sort of loyalty to the, you know, familial loyalty to the team. So that's just the way it is. You know, I don't yeah. chop and change. It's just who I am. Very good. Well, I, so I'm an Arsenal fan. No, it's nothing to do with oh, familial yeah. loyalty. It's just that <laughs> my friend, when I this is how it works in Northern Ireland, because you know you, you have to yeah. pick a Premier League team. So my friend told me when I was six that I needed to support Arsenal, and that was it. Okay. That's the commitment made. So, yeah. Well, we're you know we're one in Christ, aren't we? And that right. ultimately is, a, yeah. is is something that's more significant than that's these right. these, oh, yeah. these football things. Yeah, the barrier between Jew and Greek. Yeah. Spurs and Arsenal has been broken down in, in Jesus. So, well, praise God for that. Decisively, decisively Absolutely. by the cross. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Amazing. Amen. Amazing. Amen, miracles, can, miracles can happen. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Why don't yeah. you um, fill us in a little bit then on your background? So we want to talk today just, just to kind of set up the conversation where we're going to go. We talk, talk about the state of British Christianity and really kind of the, what I would describe as the wokeification, to coin a term, of particularly the Church of England, but we might also look a little bit more broadly because my, my context sits a little bit outside of that. I'm currently in the Church of Ireland, so, so, but I have a background mm -hmm. in more sort of non-denominational Christianity. But give us a little bit of your background and how you guys as sort of three Anglicans without a major uh, platform or some massive megachurch backing it went on to have this podcast where that came from and how you guys came to prominence. Um, yeah. Well, well, I mean, it depends how far back you really want me to go. But I mean, I suppose with the podcast, um, you know, I knew Tom from we were at theological college together and um, in, in Cudson in Oxford. And uh, we, we were friends. And I think the, the, the sort of genesis of the podcast itself came from uh, when the COVID lockdowns started happening. Mm. I'm sure you can remember how it was everyone was sort of reacting to what was going on. And I think Tom and I were pretty disturbed by various aspects of, you know, the governmental response, but then the church response as well, which just seemed crazy, really, in lots mm. of ways, you know, particularly when, when the church, you know, we've spoken about this a lot on the podcast, but, you know, when the churches were shut down uh, and when we were told, you know, even priests couldn't go into the churches right. and uh, they could use them as food banks, they could go in to clean them and flush the toilets and things like that, but they couldn't. They couldn't go in them to pray, and we certainly couldn't have services, you know. And you had the Archbishop of Canterbury celebrating Holy Communion in his kitchen and live streaming it, and this being kind of put forward as a, you know, sort of model of a legitimate model of ministry and so on and so forth. Anyway, it was all pretty disturbing, um, and we didn't really feel like um, there was a any kind of well authentic Christian or theological response to 
what was happening mm-hmm. and we felt like it was a really great opportunity that was was not only being missed it was being kind of spurned you know so we we decided to just try something out and the first episode we did we called it uh, the fear of death and it was wow. it was very different it was very different to the way the podcast is now it was much more cautious you know it was just us it was kind of like a sort of biblical exposition really of, we were talking about you know what the bible says about death what the christian attitude is towards death how we should um I don't know how we should deal with the fear of death, as the title would suggest, mm. and then how it related to the fear that people currently felt, felt. And we did talk a bit about, you know, the way we felt that that fear was being stoked up by the government and the media in perhaps ways that were inappropriate. But it was all very, very cautious. Anyway, it, it, it found an audience, a small audience at first, but, you know, we started getting shared on things like the Daily Skeptic website and things like that. Yeah. But then I had I had a, an interview with um, James Dellingpole. Um, it was, I can't remember when, I think it was in April uh, 2021. And that was that. Uh, that it was at that point. It was really through Delling Paul's audience that you know the the figures kind of went from being hundreds mm. to thousands, and right. then that was kind of how we we got we got sort of uh, slightly more well known. Yeah. So so that's kind of how it started, really, and it's kind of right. gone from there because I mean, and I can I can go into any of this stuff in any detail if you'd like me to, but but essentially, I, I think that the the COVID situation is kind of disclosive or indicative of something much much deeper that's happening in the Church of England, but you might say more broadly in, in British culture and society, um, and it's kind of reflected in the church. Uh but but we we we've talked not just about COVID, but about the the other, let's say, departures from from Orthodox Christianity that we yeah. see in the church, the kind of challenges that 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 genuine Orthodox Christianity has to face in the culture. Um, you know, the sort of post post-Christian, nihilistic, anti-human uh, trends that you can see in so many different in so many different ways, uh, so many different cri- you know ostensible crises that we yeah. face in in society, you know, climate change or um, uh, pa- so-called pandemics or or the um, the manifestation of that sort of anti-human post-Christian trend in in um, abortion euthanasia yeah. transgenderism transhumanism humanism i think our conversations in our conversations we sort of see all these things as interlinked you know as being part mm. of this kind of post-christian phenomenon yeah so anyway that's basically what the podcast is about lots of stuff lots of stuff there very good and yeah i mean i originally heard you through the james Dellingpool podcast that was where i i first heard of you guys and yeah. thought that interview was excellent. I remember it. it must have been it must have been like straight after it came out. I was you know regularly listening to him at that point, and uh, and yeah. then got on to you guys. Uh, and you were, I would say, at least in my in my uh, sort of looking around, you guys were really the only voice of note in UK Christianity that I saw. I mean, maybe there were others, but there weren't many who were kind of pushing back. Um, in yeah. in that in that time period on on a lot of this stuff, I think some people now have, have gradually started to wake up to it a little bit, but I think you were quite early on that. And so so you had you really did hit um, a sort of need there, I think, within within British Christianity, yeah. and uh, it was interesting just how receptive, in spite of the fact that the leaders of the British Church were so cautious to talk about these things, the audience was there; people wanted it. And I just I just thought that was remarkable. Yeah, yeah. I, 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 I still find it very bizarre to hear you say such a thing. You know, there wasn't really anyone else doing that. And I, I don't even I think it's probably true. I mean, I maybe there maybe there were and I just wasn't really aware of it. But there there were people who were pushing back slightly against some of the things that the church was saying, you know, like I remember Marcus Walker, who's a, a priest at St um where is it uh, some some bartholomews in in london he was sort of pushing back against it but he wasn't sort of fundamentally challenging what was going on which is what what we were doing you know we were saying we think what's going on is wrong and we think it's destructive and we think the church's response is um is not right either so so i think yeah maybe we were the only one saying that in public but but i think that there, I mean, there were a couple of other priests. I mean, people I know personally who were who were a little bit more outspoken. 
we may have been the only ones who had a podcast. It does seem crazy to me. And it seems sort of, you know, Tom and I started it and then Daniel came on board, you know, quite early on when right. we met him through a mutual friend. But I suppose it's it seems crazy that, you know, two guys, and Tom and I were curates at the time. You know, I wasn't even, I was ordained deacon. I hadn't even been ordained priest. It right, was well. just, you know, very, very beginning of my ordained um, ministry. And, you know, I, I suppose we were just the only ones who were willing to to say these kind of things in public. And that's why we found the audience. But really, it should have in a in a in a sane world. I mean, Daniel wrote an article recently for the conservative woman where he imagined an alternative history in which the Archbishop of Canterbury had stood up and challenged the COVID measures and yeah. said, you know, we're going to keep our churches open. And then eventually he's kind of imprisoned and became a, a sort of Nelson Mandela like figure. Right. I mean, that sort of thing. That sort of feels like the kind of thing that should have happened. Absolutely, you know, it shouldn't yeah. be like a couple of curates uh, making a podcast. You know, that's that's crazy. That's that's mad. And I think also it's not it's not it's not us. You know, it, it's not because we did something, you know, of exceptionally high quality. It's just because we were the ones who were saying it. You know, that's 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 the way I see it. You yeah. know, so we I, and there aren't. You know, I, I believe in the providence of God. So I think God um, was involved in that decision. Um, and he's, I, I believe, he's using the podcast in lots of different ways um, mm. to, to reach people. And we get we get amazing feedback, amazing emails from people um, talking about how they've become Christians, and you know, or they've come back to Christ, or just get this kind of thing all the time. The podcast has clearly been very meaningful for lots of yeah. people, so it's it's an amazing thing in that respect. And I, I do see the providential hand of God yeah. in the whole thing, really. Absolutely. Yeah, no, it's wonderful. Um, yeah, I think it's interesting. I mean, it seems like um, we'll get into, so, the, so there was an article in the Times, and we'll, we'll get to that in just a wee second, because yeah, I think it's relevant mm-hmm. to our discussion. But um, it's interesting that I, what I find anyway is that a lot of the uh, broader Christian church in, in Britain, but Anglicanism as well, very much so, um, had sort of so there, there are areas that some people are not willing to compromise on, and the the sexuality one there has been more resistance to. But if you look at say COVID or climate change or the race issue, all of which have been major, um, it feels like they, broadly speaking, people were willing to bend over backwards to follow the cultural line on all of that stuff. And I think that perhaps is why I don't know they weren't um, they they were so trained at sort of subservience and not actually speaking up because it they couldn't find a specific verse that this was violating. Now yeah, they've been kind yeah. of pushed into that corner when it comes to the sexuality issue. And now some are starting to find their voice, but I think um, there's a, there was a fundamental problem there of a lack of courage that I think that was probably the thing that really caught with you guys, at least in my estimation. Yeah, yeah. So that's, yeah, that's an interesting thing. And it has been something that's occurred to me Um I mean, even even prior to even prior to the the COVID thing, um, it seems to me that particularly in the evangelical world, and I, I really don't mean this in any way as a criticism, because I think it's right to be based in Scripture and to hold Scripture as the highest authority and, and, and to derive a doctrine and practice from it and all of that stuff. I think that's right, but I think perhaps. Um, Sometimes what can happen is that you get a situation where something comes up which scripture doesn't exactly address directly mm. and the sort of the instinctive reaction is to just go with the culture because it's not sort of explicitly forbidden in scripture or something like that but obviously the the problem with that is is when something you know something pernicious is something that's yeah. it is actually fundamentally ungodly or, or anti-christian or whatever it might be and just because you don't have chapter and verse on it doesn't mean that you shouldn't oppose it you know it doesn't mean that you don't you know you don't you don't say anything about it or you just go along with it but as you say it's the it's the and it, look, i'm i'm a sinful person as well and you know i speak from my own experience as a sinful human being but you know it's the inclination of the human heart to want to be loved by by the world you know to be, want to be popular to not to not be persecuted to not be marginalized to not be you know ostracized and so on and so that's the that's the inclination that we all have and it's it's something that you know that well in the case of covid it clearly hasn't been checked you know people yeah. have people didn't check the state of their hearts to to think you know is this 
is this really something that's that's right and that we should all go along with or should we yeah. or should we be critiquing certain aspects of it or perhaps all of it you know yeah so yeah no absolutely no i think i mean i think there is obviously there's um you know, when it comes to some of those those other issues, uh, I think I think you can you can search the scriptures and go. Well, there is a biblical framework and worldview for viewing these things. So, so I think mm. that's important as well. But yeah, absolutely. Like there's there's a sense in which um, th- those ones are a bit trickier. You can understand why people find them trickier, uh, but nonetheless, uh, courage is the fundamental kind of issue, yeah. and and fear of man would be, I, I would say, one of the besetting sins of of British Christianity. So, um, yeah. Get, yeah. Let, getting into then this, uh, so so there was a big survey done in the Times, uh, which for anyone watching from abroad probably heard of the Times, well known newspaper here um yeah. but it was a survey of clergy within the church of england and i'll read i'll i mean it, there were some there were some methodological flaws with it and uh, we could briefly address those but nonetheless some of these stats in it are are fairly discouraging it might not be quite as bad as it appears but what they came out with at the end was it of it was that of um, 1,185 clergy, around half would be willing to conduct same-sex weddings, 700 would offer same-sex blessings, 750 support clergy being able to enter same-sex marriages marriages, and uh, dropping the opposition to premarital sex. And then, and and even if and even if that did have some issues, there are other things that we can see within the Church of England that have happened, like the um, current or a recent move towards sort of acceptance and blessing of same-sex marriages uh, which was passed recently roughly half of anglicans seem to be for that and uh, other things like race quotas and so on on, on other issues uh, g- give some of your sort of initial thoughts and reaction to that then and how reflective of christianity in in uh, particularly the church of england is that yeah. So, I mean, you say there are methodological issues with the survey and there probably are, but um, the results don't surprise me at all, to be honest with you. Mm. Not really. I, I mean, uh, yeah, I, I think you probably say that. I mean, I got the email from the Times and I answered it, but I, I think um, probably the majority of um, people who answered it were well, let's say it's it, let's say it like this. It's a self-selecting survey, isn't it? So 5,000 people got sent the email. I think it's probably likely that people who responded to the email were more inclined that way because I think there's something about the mindset. But even so, it doesn't really, it doesn't surprise me at all. You know, having been to, to Cudston, um, you know, I'd have said uh, Cudston's probably the most liberal college in the Church of England, to be fair, but I'd have, I'd right. have said the numbers would be even higher at Cudston in terms of those in favour of liberalisation, probably more like 90% on all of those sort of issues. So it doesn't surprise me at all. Um, and, and and all it does ultimately is it reflects the, the mindset of the, the clergy in the Church of England. And there is a kind of bias towards um, selecting and training those sorts of people uh, and uh, I mean, it's it doesn't. It, I, I suppose the sort of question about the state of British Christianity it doesn't it doesn't necessarily say so much about that as it does about the clergy in the Church of England. But and you can see that because with the um, with the Brexit thing, uh, you've got a situation where you know the vast majority of these clergy who were surveyed, and just it's just obvious that the vast majority of clergy in the UK um, voted voted to remain. Yeah. And and that the and that that's that's in contrast to the congregations in the Church of England who are, I, I don't know about overwhelmingly in favour of Brexit, but certainly in favour of Brexit. So right. there is a mismatch between clergy and 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 congregation uh, in the in the church. You know, you do have this kind of thing of of the sort of liberal uh, metropolitan types being trained and ordained, and and. Um, your 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 congregations being more kind of traditional conservative slightly right. older demographic and all that kind of stuff so i know you can probe that a little bit further but that's kind of my initial thoughts about it yeah so uh, just just uh, you said about going to a very liberal college then sorry this is slightly off track but i think it's interesting why why are you not no, some good. raging flaming liberal why 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 are you why do you believe the bible still uh, what what caused you to stay faithful and not go that direction no i mean that's not that's not off track at all because i think lots of people Lots of people do go in that direction. I mean, I, I'm from an evangelical 
background and I still sort of think of myself as an evangelical in lots of ways I, the way I think about myself is really as an evangelical Catholic so it's like a small c Catholic right. um, you know I'm an Anglo-Catholic now but I still think of myself as an evangelical and, and as I say hold to those to those aspects of evangelicalism which I consider to be absolutely fundamental you know the, the primacy of, of scripture and discipleship and evangelism and all that kind of stuff mm. um, but so but the way I the way I've chosen to sort of go is um you know, with 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 you know a huge amount of respect and love for for the evangelical church. You know, having having some problems and 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 a sense of like having to work through stuff in that environment led me to embrace you know what I see as a kind of more holistic Catholic view of of the Christian church and the Christian faith. You know, more to me an even even deeper uh, traditionalism and, and conservatism. Um, because it's because the way my thinking changed was thinking well it, going you know br- broadly speaking going from thinking well it's just about me and the bible to to recognizing that um it's not just about me and the bible it's about it's about the church of christ you know it's about the the church stretching through through history back to christ you know it's about the global church which exists on earth today um, it's not just about me and the Bible. It's about how the church has read scripture collectively as mm. as guided by the Holy Spirit. And that to me, that sort of way of thinking solved a lot of the the difficulties I was having at the time. Right. You know, the sort of in the environment I was in anyway, sort of feeling like this is very individualistic and there are aspects of it which, which are quite which are quite superficial. Um so I, I I decided to go in that direction. I, I see the sort of small C Catholic thing as a way of um, a way of remaining orthodox and having a having a guide and having something sure and steadfast. And indeed, I think that's actually a legitimate interpretation of what it means to be an Anglican Christian, mm-hmm. just in a general sense. You don't even need to use a word like Catholic. It's just I, I find that to be a helpful word in that regard. But I think there are lots of people, this is something I saw at college, there are lots of people who, who were evangelicals. Right. And so they had a they had a sort of very genuine faith you know maybe like a very genuine encounter with christ but then encountered problems maybe similar problems to the problems i had you know like maybe superficiality maybe a sort of narrowness a sort of sort of dogmatism which made them feel kind of stultified and, and hemmed in and a lot of people the way they dealt with that i mean a good public example would be somebody i, I would say like steve chalk yeah um, sure. but you, the way the way they deal with that isn't by saying well you know maybe what we need to do is sort of um maybe what we need to do is is embrace a, a deeper you know a more holistic version of orthodox christianity by 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 looking again at the tradition and and so on and our, our understanding of what the church is um maybe what we need to do actually is move beyond evangelicalism and its presuppositions and just kind of deconstruct the faith in that sense and as we deconstruct it then we can then we can sort of put it back together again in a sort of more compassionate and tolerant um and progressive way mm. and of course then what you get is you get you get a form of christianity which just simply you know just simply reflects the culture that yeah. we're living in now yeah. and so yeah i say steve chalk is i mean that just came to mind because i was just for some reason i don't follow steve chalk but he comes up on my twitter feed which i find yes. intensely annoying mine too yeah. i always comment something yeah. back and twitter obviously realizes that he enrages yeah. me and then puts him there yeah <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like it's trying to antagonize me. But yeah, yeah he's a, he's a good example of that. So they deconstruct you deconstruct the kind of the the premises of your faith, and then mm. you reconstruct them in in basically your own you know according to your own preferences. So you know, I feel like the faith I had before was lacking compassion to minorities. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take my new conception of what it means to be compassionate and sort of mm. reintegrate that into the Christian faith. Yeah. So I think that that kind of thing happens. So I do think. Um, I do think a lot of it has got to do with how people respond to to the kind of evangelical paradigm and sort of where you go with that. I think that's a really, really important yeah. question, actually. Um, so, so there's yeah, there's 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 some thoughts, but but yeah, yeah I mean, the reason I the reason I'm not a, I would never be a liberal Christian. I just would I would prefer not to be a Christian. It just to me it makes no sense whatsoever. It's like you know if if there's no point doing this if you don't really believe it. And yeah. I, what's the what's the point? I mean, honestly, why why get up early and go to church on Sunday? Morning? Why spend time like you know time and effort praying and 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 studying scripture and and all of these stuff? I suppose things. I mean, you you could you might think of them as a kind of you know an interesting hobby or something like that. But really, there are other things you could be doing with your time. Mm. The only reason the only reason I 
I am a, a, a an Orthodox Christian is because I think it's I think it's true. True. Yeah. And the other the other the other reason the other thing I see as well about the sort of liberal Christianity is it just seems to be so, such a sort of it's just an intensification of the premises that we already live with. You know, the sort of mm. hyper individualism and sort of sentimentality of and superficiality of this culture. It's just people just use it in order to enable more of the same kind of behavior and mindset you know that and and that to me it doesn't it doesn't appeal in any in any way to me i just i just find that i just find that deeply unappealing mm. you know i think that that kind of thing needs to be resisted i don't think we need a kind of you know a sort of uh, to baptize it and using you know quasi, quasi or pseudo christian language i just yeah. think that's you know it's completely wrong very good yeah no i think um I agree with, with a lot of what you say about evangelicalism there, and I think there is recently what I've seen, and, and I probably am I'm exposed to slightly different circles um, mm. th th than you are, and I would follow guys. I, I don't know, maybe, maybe you would follow the same ones, but um, it's, guy, there's guys over in the States, uh, and, and they're really you know, digging into the history of of Christianity. They're really getting into the roots. They're reading these texts that have come through. I was, uh, my first interview, I've only done a few interviews, but it was with a guy called Joel Webbin, who's a, who's a sort of reformed um, Baptist kind of character. Mm. Um, but I asked him roughly a similar question, you know, because he came out of a, a sort of liberalizing evangelical denomination. And I yeah. said, why did you not go there? And he said, yeah, I read dead guys. You know, that was the main thing, yeah. you know, I re and I think yeah. evangelicalism at its best, I think, recognizes, should recognize that need that, yeah, me and my Bible is insufficient and we do operate in a broader uh, Christian context and we operate in uh, uh, the, the context of the historical Christian faith. Um, and C.S. Lewis has a wonderful bit uh, on in this sort of introduction to um is it Athanasius? Yeah, it's Athanasius's book yeah, on the yeah. incarnation. He talks about the reading of old books and basically says the point yeah. that they have they have different blind spots, but but what they do is they point out yours. You you can see theirs, but they also speak into yours, and it shows yeah. you where the blind spots are in your day. So so I think that that's absolutely the case. Um, yeah. Also, also, I think what you're saying is very interesting in terms of just that divide between. So let's let's get on to that a little bit more. The divide between the clergy and the laity, or between you know those those who are, are leading churches and those who are attending. Um, yeah, there's a couple of stats on that that I think are really interesting. I read a book called The Myth of the Dying Church, and it said that a a practicing homosexual person is two times more likely to attend a church that disagrees with them on that position <laughs> than one that agrees, which is just a remarkable thought. But it, it makes plenty of sense because people are looking like if someone's going to church broadly speaking they're looking for christianity and they're looking for mm. real christianity that's why they're there and they recognize that the liberal yeah. stuff isn't it um and similar mm. stats would bear out so so i know within uh, the church of england um they, there was a big study done on kind of i don't know if it, sorry, it wasn't that big a study but they looked at some of the largest the 33 largest churches in terms of attendance and numbers of under 16s and their public views either i think 20 of them were clearly identified as being sort of conservative on that issue and the others were silent yeah. none of them were liberal on it so yeah. so um why why is the church doing this then like where did this come from that we need to raise people up into leadership that don't believe either what the congregations want them to believe, which you would think the, that's the pragmatic thing to do. So they're not even pragmatic about it. And they also don't believe what the Bible says or the historic positions of the, the church. Like, like, where did that start? How has that happened? If you know, you might not, but if you have thoughts on that. Yeah, I mean, I do have some thoughts on it. I mean, I think it, um, I mean, some people would say it began, you know, in the 19th century with a kind of, um, different ways people began to understand what the Church of England is and what, what Anglicanism is about. I mean, if you're a Roman Catholic, you'd probably say it begins at the point of the Reformation because, you know, that's the point at which the Church of England uh, split from the, the authority of the Roman Church. But, I mean, I think you can you can decisively say that um, it, it began to happen in the 20th century when I think there are two things. Firstly, there was the, 
the liturgical revolution. So we basically got rid of the prayer book and started to replace it with different liturgy. And I think it's really significant for the Church of England because our doctrine is embedded, or at least it was embedded. I mean, it, it, I mean, Tom Pellet, my co-host, would say it very much still is embedded in the Book of Common Prayer. Mm-hmm. Uh, so when you sort of get rid of the Book of Common Prayer, replace it, or at least you know relativize it by introducing other things, even though you claim that these things are all congruent, you create confusion. And now you've got a situation where we have, you know, we have a, um, a kind of suite of books called um, Common Worship, which is, you know, it's such, it's so complicated that you know you have to buy like fifty books to 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 possess it all. And then it's it's you know it's arguably doesn't really hang together, even if you sort of understand everything that's being said. It's just an attempt to please everyone, really. So anyway, you've got a kind of liturgical revolution that happens, and then you also have a sort of theological, or you might even say a sort of intellectual revolution which you could look at you know you could look at a book like honest to god by the the bishop of woolwich which was released in 1963 that was when michael ramsey was the um archbishop of canterbury and that book was it was definitely heterodox you know in, in right. terms of what it was arguing about about the existence of god you know it's arguably a book which is kind of arguing for for a uh, atheistic understanding of god it's certainly right. christ its christology was heterodox as well it was it was basically a kind of um uh, what's what's the heresy which just makes out Jesus to be a human being? Uh, uh, I can't remember what it, which one it is, but it, sorry, the, the the precise heresy has just escaped my mind. But but basically oh, that which is which is which is quite common, I think now in the Church of England, you know the way you sort of the way you deal with with the whole notion of of Christ and and um, the atonement and so on is to basically just uh, focus on the fact that he's he was more like a man, you know, a man a man for others, you know, and, and sort of um, not 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 focus so much on the divine aspect of him. So anyway, so that book I think was very influential, but I think that was indicative of of lots of liberalising trends that were going on in terms of theology, probably in the in in well definitely in the in the academy, but also in, um, in terms of people te- teaching in theological colleges and so on and so forth uh, at the time. Um, so. So I think that that's that's broadly speaking what happened. I think there were sort of two two revolutions, liturgical and theological, and they were related to each other. Um, this thing is, I mean, a, an important aspect of it is that it's not a it's not a grassroots thing by any means. It's not something that springs up from from ordinary Christians. It's a sort of elite. Um, it's an elite academic thing that 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 happens at you know the level of the the university mm. and 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 sort of trickles down um it, you know really lots of that stuff you know honest to god john robinson was you know lots of it was was uh, um influenced by 19th century uh 19th and 20th century kind of german protestantism right yeah um much of which was just a you know it was just quite clearly a heterodox departure from mm-hmm. from orthodox biblical christianity the 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 um the one exception would be that he he used dietrich bonhoeffer quite a lot in his book but i i, I personally think he misused bonhoeffer i think bonhoeffer was an orthodox christian and i think he, he just misused him so i wouldn't include bonhoeffer in that but certainly some of the other people sure. that um that he was he was talking about he was kind of he was kind of uh introducing he was sort of Filtering into the mainstream of of the church, of the Church of England and Anglicanism, that those kind of strains of thought from that kind of nineteenth century, um, you know, uh, demythol- demythologization of you know, people like uh, Rudolf Boltzmann, for example, yeah, um, in into into the mainstream of the Church of England, and and I think that 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 was that was hugely damaging, and that was that's he's the most famous, but that that was a kind of current that was going on at the time. So I think it was I think it was that that stuff really. By the way, the the heresy that I was trying to think of is Nestorianism. Nestorian, it's just come back I into my mind. said Nestorianism, and then yeah. I was like, I, I wasn't confident yeah. enough you, to say you, it. You, you yeah. missed your opportunity. You uh, should have said it. I could have looked very smart, but unfortunately, <laughs> I'm not that smart, and people will find yeah. this out. I'm much better if I prepare well, my videos. So yeah, yeah. Well, no, you know, you, you seem pretty intelligent to me. Uh, so, you know, yeah, that's that's because I managed to edit and research everything before I put it together. You know, most of the time when <laughs> right. it's in an okay. interview, you realize that my memory and grasp of things is not, not quite as good as that. Not as articulate as it is whenever I cut it together and use B-roll and everything, you know. Yeah, well, that's or, helpful, isn't it? Yeah. 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 No, Nestorianism, I think that that is that is the heresy. It's the kind of playing down of the of the the divine aspect of Christ and kind of turning yeah. Christ into a sort of a, like a great saint. So what it does is it sort of puts us on the same level as ontological level as Christ. It means that oh Christ was very very great, but he was nevertheless quite like us as well and so 
And so the kind of divine cosmic savior aspect of things is is sort of removed and mm. and we're put on the same plane as Jesus, you know, because Jesus is like a man for others. He's a, he's basically a human being, a very great human being, but a human being. And therefore we can participate with him in being loving great human beings ourselves and that that coheres very very nicely with the kind of view of the gospel as being about the amelioration of the of social conditions of, mm-hmm. of 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 the the environment around us so if that's all jesus was doing albeit in a very great way we can do that as well you know we can be yeah. a man for others as well and we can we can bring justice to society and blah 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 and and christ is not Christ is 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 just that he's not also a, a cosmic savior mm. who who needs to die for our sin and, r- and redeem us from the powers of darkness that that aspect of it is kind of lost in in that whole way of looking yeah. at things yeah very good yeah I think there is something there where you know referencing back to say Steve Chalk as a, as a good example of this and, and broader sort of liberal Christianity is when when you disconnect the faith from both the divine and the historical, you end mm. up with all, all you have is the trends of today. You know, you go, it's year yeah. zero. We can reinvent the whole thing, whatever's popular. We have no standard either that our, our ancestors and, and those who brought the faith to us would hold us to or that God himself would yeah. hold us to. And it just ends up with, with, as you said, a church that is basically a mirror to the culture. Um, which, is, which is probably not yeah. not effective, uh, definitely not effective, as we've seen. Yeah. Um, well, and also the, the the interesting thing about that is with the time survey um, is uh, I had a conversation on um, was where was it was it on the Times I think it was on the Times radio show um, with this lady called Martin Oborn who's a who's a female um, vicar in the Church of England and she's the chairwoman of an organisation called Watch Women in the Church but she was actually arguing that um, that our society is reflective of the the intentions of Christ and and the disciples and and that this is you know this is the way we need to go because the, the the society is actually more Christian than the church and I actually I was actually it was a talking head on a on a Radio Four thing as well where there were other clergy who were responding to the survey who were saying pretty much the same thing like one of them said it's good that so many clergy recognise the Christian aspects of the the culture out there so i think if you're gonna if you're gonna if you're gonna go down that path there is a kind of consistency there but but in order to in order to say that firstly you need to say that the culture out here is more christian than the church has pretty much ever been in two thousand years because mm-hmm. the church has never looked like this right uh, you know with with you know gay marriage and and transgenderism or whatever it might be it's never looked like that so you've got to say that the society is actually more progressive than the church in that sense but you've also got to say that our society is sort of uniquely superior to every other society that's ever right. existed including all the other societies in the world and to my mind that's um that that's very well it doesn't sit well with a with a kind of liberal progressive critique of of cultural imperialism and you know the british right. empire it's, yeah it's colonialism like yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a kind of intellectual and and yeah, sort of um, intellectual colonialism or whatever. Yeah. whatever. But but you, you you know what I mean. It's it's you you have to say that our society is the greatest society that's ever existed. And also the other thing I was thinking is that if you want to say that about the church, that what we need to do is imitate the culture. There's another question there, which is: is it just this culture that we need to Im- mm. imitate? In other words, is it a strategy that you're advocating? And I'd I'd like to ask somebody. This question is it strategy that you're advocating like if we imitate the culture then the culture will come to the church is that the strategy in which case you know if we were in a say a culture where they have polygamy or where they have a kind of extreme patriarchy should should we incorporate that into christianity and and hope that that speaks to the culture or is it is it the case that our culture is so uniquely brilliant and amazing that we should imitate this culture and then we should sort of export a sort of liberal progressive Christianity mm. to the other nations of, of the earth or or is it even is Christianity even something that you should you should do that with I mean I, I don't know it but I, I think it's yeah the implications of it are kind of yeah sort of interesting I think yeah no absolutely yeah I think I think very much it's the second it's we need to export this if you look at the response of you know the liberal church to 
where Anglicanism is in fact growing and flourishing, which is mm. conservative Bible believing Anglicanism in the global yeah. south. Yeah. They they are not yeah. interested in that. They are not celebrating that. They they want that to no. be reformed and made like liberal Christianity. Very convenient that, you know, yeah. what Jesus really wants is exactly what will get us away with no uh, moral, um, you know, condemnation from the world. Also, just I yeah. couldn't help but smiling at the start there because you said uh, the organization was, I think you said it was women and the church and you, watch, but I I heard women in the church and that's which, which I think is probably better. I think we could, I think we could say we could, we could offer a rebrand for them and uh, see if they take yeah. up on, take us up on that. Interesting. Yeah. yeah. There you Interesting go. Interesting idea. Yeah. So, yeah. so what I is that? I won't comment, Jamie. That no. would get me into trouble if I comment yeah. on that. That's fine. I'm happy to, to get in that trouble. Um, <laughs> in terms of then, right. So, I don't know if you've, you've, I don't know if you've heard this language before, but you'll certainly recognize the concepts. And um, there's a, I think he's a sociologist. He's a Christian guy called Aaron Wren. And he came up with this mm-hmm. sort of framework of the Christian positive world, the Christian neutral world, and the Christian negative world. Um, okay. like he based, it, based on American society, but you can kind of see the same thing across the West where, you know, there was a point in history where being a Christian was a, a positive moral good to the wider world, you know, good church going person, good living, you know, thumbs up where we think that's a good thing. Uh, then you get into sort of late postmodernism and it becomes a neutral thing where it's to each their own and so on. And then very much it, uh, what we see today is that being Christian in and certainly any form of Bible believing Christian anyway, is considered to be morally negative, so you're a bigot or, you know, whatever it may be, whatever ism they want to throw at you. Um, I think I think that framework is, is good explanatory power. It's good good thing um, and, and certainly something I, I think we can recognise broadly. So, so it seems like we're very much living in an increasingly negative culture. Um, if the role of the church is not to reflect that, um, what what is the the primary role of the church in a society that looks like that? Like, what is the thing that we are called to do more than anything else in in a world that is starting to turn its back on the Christian faith? Yeah, well, I mean, you know, my my view is is fairly straightforward. Really, it's it's that um, firstly we should continue to proclaim the orthodox Christian faith. You know, just just in a in a basic sense, you know that we have a message which is given to us by Christ, um, passed down to us through the Scriptures, um, through the Church, which is very very clear. You know, it's it's about um, lots of things, but it's fundamentally about believing in Jesus, repenting, and and being reconciled to God, and that this is our message to humanity. So we have to insist upon the centrality of that, and, and that that means. That's also a, that's also a question of emphasis as well, because, you know, in our one of the problems I think we've got is that we might sort of, um, you know, sign up to that on a kind of ostensible level. But then how how much do we actually put that front and center in, in terms of what we're doing and what you hear mm. so much, you know, in the sort of public Church of England stuff is so, is so much about like climate change and, you know, whatever, it, whatever else yeah. it might be. And, and, and you don't really ever hear anything about about this about sin, about repentance, about forgiveness, about reconciliation, about the cross. You know, this is the this is the centrality of our faith. So we mm. actually have to proclaim this afresh in every generation, regardless of what the culture is like, really. Um, doesn't doesn't make a difference. But then the other thing I think to say, you know, so I think that's a really important thing. You know, really want to emphasize that the Orthodox yeah. Christian faith, the gospel, you know, um, and then we disciple people in in the truth, you know, as they come for for to be baptized and and um, to become part of the church, you know, we disciple people in the tu- truth and help them to live as Christian disciples. That's the basic idea, isn't it? It's, it's, it shouldn't be that. It shouldn't be controversial. Mm-hmm. Uh, it shouldn't be sort of um, something that is new to anyone really who's a, a Christian or a, or a minister or anything. I think the other thing is if you're in that kind of Christian negative society, or what was the what was the exact? Yeah, that was the term that I think he there. used. Yeah, 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 Christian negative. Yeah. So if you are in that. I think then there's the question about the prophetic role. I mean, the prophetic mm. role is always something that we 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 have uh, we have to fulfil. I think as a church, but when you're in a when you're in a society like ours, and this is you know, it's not to be too grand about it, but I do I do see this as something an aspect of our podcast as well. 
when you're in a society like ours, which is sort of increasingly um, post-human, which is clearly perpetrating um, an assault on the image of God in humanity in so many different ways, and which is not only perpetrating the assault, but is also perpetrating deception and mm. and bamboozlement for, for humanity. I think the church is there to provide um, to provide a challenge. You know, we're here to speak the truth. We're here to discern the truth, firstly, and not to be taken in by the by the false narratives. Um, to discern the truth, to articulate the truth, and to help people to see the truth, and 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 to call out the the actual crimes and injustices that are being perpetrated not the ones which are not the you know the fake the fake kind of you know current thing type narratives yeah. uh, which the media tell us we should be we up, be upset about but the actual things that are that are happening you know which are which are moving in a particular direction and and the signs about which are only that they'll get worse so you know i'm thinking about things like the abortion industry which yeah. is responsible for the deaths of millions of, of children every year. Uh, I'm thinking about things like the increasing prevalence of, of euthanasia in, in the Western world. You know, you just have to look at what's going on in Canada, where they're euthanizing people for being depressed or or being in debt or, you know, p- p- increasingly younger people as well. You know, that kind of thing, it's it's going to it's going to spread and it's it's going to get worse. And I think also, you know, con- and it is controversial, it shouldn't be, but the the uh, the. Uh, the sterilization and medicalization of, of children with a view to um with a view to mutilating their genitalia and telling them that they can be be a different gender i mean these things are evil and mm. and they are an assault on on the image of god in humanity a lot of a lot of the time it's to do with children uh, and I, I believe it's our job as the church to, to to speak when we see evil things like this happening so yeah. you know i think that 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 is something that we're we're called to um and it does. It's hard, obviously, because because people are so brainwashed, and a lot of people are really scared that they'll get in trouble. You know, we have this sort of council culture where people are targeted, and you know, people are people are attacked. But you know, I still think that this is this is the this is the role that that the, at least part of the role that the church is called to play. Yeah. Yeah. No, I agree with that fully. I think I, I did a video a couple of weeks ago, one of my short ones. And it talked at the end. So it was really about the law of God and the importance of the law of God. Sometimes we think it's yeah. it's just the gospel, but the, the law of God is important. Like it's also in the Bible and what God says you should do and should not do to one another. And you look at the things yeah. that our governments and our society are, are perpetrating on particularly the most vulnerable, particularly look at kids and, and as you said, things like euthanasia. The, the law of God condemns that like 100 percent. And there's a there's that rule is important, uh, that prophetic yeah. rule. Um, and sometimes I think we 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 do shy away from that second. But I think I think you'll get, you know, in most contexts, I think if you said the first, but we want to proclaim the gospel and the Orthodox faith, most people will will go amen. But they'll leave it there. You know, it's like we'll we'll keep we can keep that vague, you know, come to Jesus and he'll fix your uh, hurt and your brokenness and, you know, forgive you. I think, yeah. which, you know, amen, like Jesus forgives us of our sin, right? But that prophetic bit is almost, that's that's the sort of sharp edge of things where I think um, there's, yeah. there's, a, there's a little extra more required of us sometimes that we don't want to give. Yeah. Um, if I could just add to that, I think, I think a lot of the time it's because of this kind of secular smokescreen that we have that we sort of... Um, we we convince ourselves that politics is is sort of somehow separate from theology in the church and you you know you hear people saying things like well you know we don't want to go back you hear christians saying things like you know we don't want to go back to a sort of a, a, a christendom or we don't want to embrace christian nationalism or wh- whatever it might be um but to me these things don't really make very much sense because um because if we are if we are truly Christians and we believe that the way God tells us to live is good for us, then why would we not want to see these things reflected in our laws? Why would we not want to implement them in our society? Mm. You know, out of this kind of mistaken idea that politics is 
you know, neutral, which is just right. clearly not true, or 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 that you know we don't want to offend people, or or, or something like that. But you know, we could yeah, obviously you, you could look you could look at, at instances where the Christian gospel has genuinely ameliorated evils in society. You know, yeah. slavery is obvious. You know, Absolutely. even the civil civil rights movement. You could say that the Christianity was really at the heart of that. Uh, in in in, a, in an absolutely central way so why would we not why would we why would we shy away from that now and say well you know we we can have an influence or some influence in society but it's kind of we we, we don't want to have a christian society mm. i just find that so bizarre i absolutely want to, there to be a christian society in this nation again you know what we, what we will see is we'll see the consequences of a post-christian nation we're already seeing it yeah and it's disaster you know as mm-hmm. we as we depart from 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 the inheritance, the ameliorating and leavening inheritance and influence of Christianity, mm. as we depart from that, we'll see what happens. You yeah. know, and, and this this idea that you know we don't, you know, we don't we don't want a Christian nation. I just find it absolutely bizarre, to be honest with you. Yeah, amen to every word of that. Know that you're speaking my language there. I'm 100 percent on board with that. I think. Yeah, I was I was at a meeting last night. And it was to do with the changes to the. Um, relationships and sexual education portion of the Northern Ireland curriculum. I've got very book basically bringing in teaching abortion and all to, and how to get them to, uh, to minors, you know, and parents don't really even have the opportunity to request withdrawal and so on. But one of the things that really bothered me, this is, this was done by the evangelical Alliance who I think do a lot of good work, but they said, you know, well, we live in a pluralistic society and we kind of have to accept that. And, and I don't accept that. I don't accept that one bit. Yeah. We are historically a Christian society. We have been for mille- like a millennium, you know, you could say yeah. more. Yeah. Uh, yeah. We we have, at least in Northern Ireland, we still have pretty high church attendance. A lot more than we have woke people. We have people going to church. Like we yeah. should be saying, no, yeah. we're a Christian society. We don't accept this on Christian grounds. We're not going to argue based off your secular paradigm. We're actually going to say, no, here are the oracles of God. And this is what we must do because this is who we are. And this is who we have always been. And this is who we're going to be once again. So, yeah, no, yeah. I think that's yeah. that's, uh, that's a key mistake we're making. Yeah. I agree. Yeah. Well, I mean, the whole notion of a pluralist society is just, well, it depends what you mean by that. But in that context, that's just... Um, that's just clearly not true, isn't it? I mean, what what they're doing is they're they're promoting their particular worldview, and they're 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 legislating for that. That's not pluralism. It's, you know, it, you can't have pluralism when you legislate for things. You have to you have to go for a particular uh, you have to go for a particular view. What you think is right based on your worldview, whether that's Christian or woke or islamic or, or whatever it is you have to legislate in favor of something yeah and if it's not if it's not christianity it's it's going to be something else yeah yeah no absolutely look we, we could talk all day i recognize you have a funeral to go to so um mm. do you want to just let people know where they can find your stuff uh, support you guys anything like that yeah yeah absolutely yeah um so um uh, all of our stuff are irreverent so it's irreverent with a d at the end it's like the word irreverent but with a d at the end irreverent it's a pun uh, irreverent.com is our website so all of our stuff is on there or you can just google us we're on all our major audio platforms uh yeah as jamie mentioned i also have a, a Substack blog which part part of it's free part of it's on a paywall just because i i earn my money on online and through writing so um jamiefranklin.substack.com is my uh, Substack, if you want to, if you want to go there, but yeah, everything's on a reverendpod dot com. Yeah, but it's good, it's good to to talk to you, Jamie, and I, I'm pleased that your YouTube channel is is going well. It looks great, and you know, really pleased to be on. You know, and I wish you all the best with it. Thank you very much, and thank you for joining joining me, and thank you for for the work that you and and uh, your co hosts do. I think it's it's really something valuable um, in in British Christianity broadly, and particularly uh, within the Anglican Communion. So thank you, and God bless. Thank you so much for watching. Also, thank you so much for your response to my recent videos. Some of them have just gone really well. I've been so encouraged by it. So thank you for all who have liked and shared and watched. I really do appreciate it. If you want to help this video get out there to the right people, please do like, retweet, share it, whatever way you can, whatever platform you are on. You can support the channel as per usual through wearecontramundum.com. You can get some merch or you can go to Patreon or PayPal and support us there. And finally, as always, if you are on YouTube, watch this next one.